Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. You're really going to love today's program. Jose Lugo is with me. Jose has an amazing story. He and his brother uh, have started something called We Are All One Story. Um, it's hard for me to summarize this story. It's fantastic. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of hope. Stay tuned. Jose Lugo, The Good Life, is next. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us today. Uh, GoodLifeTelevision.org is always up. You can see the interviews from the last year, some amazing stories uh, like we have to here today. Uh, but th there's the full form interviews are there. And then there's also what we call power clips, which are kind of some of the, the great moments and, and uh, parts of those stories. So check it out, GoodLifeTelevision.org. And you can find us on social media. Uh, today, I'm really excited about uh, my guest, Jose. Hi. Good to have you, Lugo. Thanks and, for having and, me. And we, uh, w this is an amazing story, and I, I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Um, all the way from Denver. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of set the table here, uh, Jose Lugo and his brother Ralph de Quebec, who's not here with us, but yeah. we're going to be having Ralph on the program as well, are two brothers uh, who've kind of had this amazing um, story, uh, individual stories, yeah. which has become something that's called we are all one and i want to get to that in a second but jose maybe just start with kind of your upbringing kind of where you came from and kind of what your road was like yeah i mean i i grew up in the inner city of san pedro and wilmington and in, in uh the county of la um, my parents divorced when i was five um, after the divorce you know my household became a very dysfunctional household um, and I grew up with uh, a mother who was an uh, extreme disciplinarian, and that was her way of, uh, you know, quote unquote, showing her love. And, um, you know, from a young age, I think that when, when you experience abuse at a young age, it, it taints your heart and it, uh, mm -hmm. it changes your worldview. And in a lot of ways, it, it yanks your innocence from you in a premature way. Mm -hmm. um, so that happened very young. And that eventually spilled over into my early adulthood. Um, you know, I ended up joining a gang when I was 16, and the violence that I saw within the gang was not too different from the, from the violence I saw at home. Um, it felt like home, it felt like love. Um, I didn't know any better. Um, I ended up going to prison when I was 18 and a half. I got a five year sentence for uh, multiple robberies and there was just more of an extension of, of the turmoil and the violence and the dysfunction that was in prison, but also that was really just all I knew in a, in a sense. And I ended up doing my sentence, my prison sentence, and I can't say that I made any plan while I was in there that I had any um, big realization or like, I'm gonna change my life when I got out. I couldn't see that far. I was just surviving every day. But during my time in prison, I was able to forgive my mom mm. because I did hold a lot of resentment towards her. And I did, um, I blamed her for a lot of things, you know. And while I was in prison, I just had the realization I was able to hear other people's stories and they would tell me about their upbringing. And the story was the same, you know, absentee dad, dysfunctional household. And there were some stories where the homies didn't even know who their mom is, who their dad is. Um, maybe they didn't get abused, but maybe their mom was an alcoholic or an addict. And my eyes and my heart were able to open towards my mom after hearing all those stories. And I got to see her just as a person. Mm. And I got to see her as somebody who's in her own story, just trying to figure it out. And you know, realizing that she did the best she could with mm -hmm. what she was given. And, um, you know, that was a big step for me in my life. Um, but I ended up getting out of prison. You know, I did find it in my heart to, to forgive my mom, you know, you know, cause who am I to, to withhold forgiveness mm -hmm. from somebody, especially given the things that I was involved in. But I still had my dad that I needed to forgive for not being there. It's a journey, right? right, and, right. and it's a lifelong journey. And, um, 
you know, when you grow up, how you grow up in the inner cities with violence and all these things, you know, you need damn near a miracle to, to change your, your perception of life. And, you know, by the grace of God, I definitely got my miracle. Um, but it just took a long time. <laughs> um, I was still institutionalized in a lot of ways when I was outside of prison. I still saw people as, as maybe enemies. As I saw people as, if I met a good person, I assumed that they were bad. Because mm. that's how I grew up. That's what I had to do to um, survive. Because that's the environment I grew up in that where people will backstab you, people will hurt you and, and these things happen repetitively and and it just solidifies a cynical worldview that quite frankly isn't true. It's just that that's all we know in that moment. Hmm. And um I went through life kind of seeing life through that lens of a of a criminal, of a of a bad person. And finally, you know, everything came crashing down. Um, you know, I had, I had gone through life thinking that I was a tough guy, that I could get things done on my own. And, you know, I ended up getting into a very deep depression and um, really trying to figure out who I was and not knowing how, not having the tools, mm. you know, to get through that. Um, you know, I was a very prideful person. Um, for the bulk for the bulk of my life you know when you grow up with nothing especially in the hood what's king in any hood is pride mm. it doesn't cost you anything mm. you can feed your ego that's free mm. and it's negative and that eventually brings you down and that's what happened to me you know i i thought that i had made it through prison made it through the streets all on my own strength and um when I was going through the mental battle, which is purely in a lot of ways spiritual, um, you can't fight that with brute force. Mm. You can't power your way through that. And um, it brought me to my knees, mm. you know, to the point where I wanted to take my own life. And, you know, just thinking about it, it, uh, it always makes me emotional because fe I don't want to forget how that felt, mm -hmm. that rock bottom. Mm -hmm. um, because it's intense and it's intense for a reason and I thought I was alone I thought my story didn't matter I thought my life didn't matter and I thought it would be best just for me to take my own life but um, on the 11th hour you know I cried out to God I said I was sorry and in that moment I didn't hear a voice I didn't you know was no great sign but I did feel a sense of hope I did feel a glimmer a very small glimmer of hope that there was a chance that mm. things could change and you know after that moment my life did begin to change and you know from that from that rock bottom you know and me realizing that my story had value just because there is no reason needed mm -hmm. and then if my life has value, that means that, you know, my story has value. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean exactly? You know, that's a big responsibility, you know, to really live your life knowing that it means something. Right. And, you know, from that, from that place came we are all one story. And all we do is try and get people to see uh, their inherent value as people, thus the value in their own story. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Thanks, man. So, in t t me, take me back to that moment again. So, you forgive your mom in prison. You come out. You hit a couple bumps, but then you get and you hit a low point of where you're really like, "I'm done." Mm -hmm. Was it like a surrender? It was definitely a surrender. It's exactly what it was. Um, realizing that I can't do it on my own. It was a surrender to, I mean, it's a surrender to God, and it's, uh, but for me, given my life, it's also, I was never remorseful for the things I had done, mm. um, and finally, I was just sorry. Like, I had, um, during the robberies, I was always sorry for the innocent people who were involved. I always had remorse for that, 
but I was never sorry for the actual crime, for the stealing, for the robbing, for the lifestyle. I just, uh, I just thought, hey, these are the cards that I was dealt. Right. You got to do what you got to do. I got to do what I got to do. Yeah. I've been hurt. If I hurt somebody, this is just part of the game. Yeah. So I held on to that. I didn't, I didn't ever, I didn't, I just wasn't sorry for it. And finally, in that moment of surrender, I had to admit that the entire way that I had lived my life was wrong. And that is a hard realization. And the only way to move forward from that, you need a catalyst. Yeah. Because to look back at your life and be 30 years old and be like, man, I just, I had it all wrong. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah, it's just surrendering, knowing that, that it's not all on me. That all I have to do is... And it's hard. I mean, it, it, it sounds it's it's dynamically complex. What's happening in that in that moment of surrender? But um, <laughs> you just got to put your hands up and say, "Hey, you know." For me, I just said, "Hey, I got it all wrong. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try doing things the right way." Yeah. And you know what? It's been working out for me. You're an amazing like you're a thoughtful guy. Like yeah, the way you talk, like you're very thoughtful and like smart. Yeah. Just a side note. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, hearing you talk, it, it kind of it, it reminds me. There's, I think it's in Ezekiel, or I forget where it is, but it talks about, I'll, I'll take your heart of stone and I'll give you a new heart. Yeah. Well, they, yeah. That kind of sounds like what happened I mean, to you. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It's like a heart transplant. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, but yeah. it changes everything. So while all this is happening, your brother, yeah. Ralph. Yeah goes off to war during after 9-11 Ralph joined this is we have to rewind we um he joined the military joined the Marine Corps after 9-11 um so when did he lose his legs he lost his lost his legs about seven or eight years ago and his life went a different trajectory you know I think when when you grow up in the hood you know you know the girls go to college the boys either go to fight for their country or they go and fight for the hood and they either go to prison or or they get hurt overseas and it's a story we hear all too often so you know mine and his stories kind of did go that way and he ended up losing his legs um is he in iraq or where, where was lost he? him in afghanistan afghanistan and uh where his story and my story came back together was um which is kind of cool story in and of itself um i was in texas and he had called me and he said uh he said yo bro i need a roommate and he was married at the time and i'm i just broke up with my girlfriend so i'm open for whatever but i just it's not making sense to me i don't want to be i don't feel comfortable being uh a roommate with you and your wife (laughs) so um It just went in one ear, out the other. Uh, He ended up calling me again before the turn of the new year, before the turn of 2017. And he said, uh, bro, I really need a roommate. And I said, well, what's what's going on? He said him and his wife are having problems. She's going to move somewhere else. And he wants to try to um, pursue his dream, making the U.S. Paralympic sled hockey team. He wants to win a gold medal. And um, I'm on the phone. I'm like, let's go. Let's do it. Um, we literally booked a flight that day. Got on the flight a few days later. Flew into Denver. Looked at a bunch of different places. The last place we saw, we signed the lease. We moved back to our states, packed our stuff, and drove to Denver. And um, he ended up making the U.S. Paralympic sled hockey team. He ended up winning a gold medal. Um, so mission accomplished on that. Um, but beyond that... Uh, Where me and him got even, you know, more close was that while I was going through my depression, he was going through his. Um, And as men, we didn't know how to talk about it. Like, we were both going through our own stuff, but just holding it all in. And, um, you know, when I had that moment of surrender, like, I just started, a realization I had was I have to just say the truth. There's no shame in the truth, Mm -hmm. whatever it is. There's only shame in how you deal with it. So all the other stuff I was going through, I just started talking to Ralph about it. And Ralph was like, man, I feel the same way. Mm. And um, 
you know, he says that he thought a gold medal was going to give him joy. He thought his gold medal was going to make him happy. That that it's it's. He thought that was what he was searching for, what his heart was searching for. And when, after he won the gold medal, he said that he still felt the same. That he still felt hurt. That he still didn't feel that he had value. And if this is somebody who's an American hero, who's an Olympic gold medalist, if he feels that his own story doesn't have value, how much easier it is for somebody who's growing up in the hood to feel that their story doesn't have right. value. And we have to realize, we both have the realization and, and the fact that our value can never be given to us by anything external. Mm-hmm. That it's inherent in our personhood, in who we are. And, um, you know, we both started, you know, believing in everything that's good and chasing after that. And, um, you know, I'm happy to have, an, have him in my life and hopefully we get him on here. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah. So he loses his legs in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, and, then, and you went to prison and then you end up in an apartment in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talking to each yeah. other about... Yeah life yeah exactly brothers exactly and how did you think of where where did this we are all one story come from well it came it just came from that place where you know I had hit uh, that rock bottom Um, I thought my story didn't mean anything once I refound the value in my own story by just remembering and believing the simple fact that my story matters because I matter as a person and um you know, like you said, you need a heart transplant. I just think that's what happened. But, um, you know, how do we put that in action? Yeah. How do we put what we believe in in action? And, um, you know, I just thought about it for a while in my head. Man, how can we word it? How can we put it together? How can it be something that we believe in? And it's just when you're creative, you know, I kind of just let the things float like a soup. And just one day I'm walking and I'm thinking we... And, we are all one story and to me it's a true statement and we rolled with it and it took a life of its own yeah story you know at this particular time in in our country and in the world in a lot of respects but specifically this year a lot of people don't feel like they matter yeah there's a lot of depression there's a lot of suicide there's a lot of anxiety there's I mean we're seeing that um come to the surface yeah so we're going to push this interview out all over the country yeah there's somebody watching right now who's where you were who's Mm -hmm. thinking it doesn't matter i don't matter i got dealt a bad hand yeah life sucks there's no hope yeah what do you say to them there's always hope um the hardest part is believing Um, how do you get somebody to believe and to somebody who who feels that their story doesn't matter it's it's simply not true Um, you know it we all know it that person knows it Um, but accept the responsibility of being a person as well Mm -hmm. you know rise to the occasion like we're here we have something good to do so find out what it is that you love to do and start doing it. Mm. You matter. Yeah, Everybody you matter. matters. Yeah, definitely. What was jail like? Oh, man. It was hell on earth, quite frankly. Um, and it's a hell that's created by ourselves. Um, you know you think we go to prison and we, we, we become reformed <laughs> you know that's the farthest thing from the truth we go to prison and we double down on our bad traits um, we refeed our ego we refeed our pride because that's all we have that's all we know and we make up you know because if we wanted to the inmates we can make it a, a utopia right it's 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 run by us and in it in a very real way but instead we go to prison there's more violence there's stabbings there's deaths there's um, pride, there's, there's stealing, there's, there's drug dealing. It's like people can't let go. We can't let go 
of what we know, even though we do know it's bad. It's become normal. So you just find a way to survive. And even in that circumstance, you can still find ways to be joyous. You can still find ways to be grateful. At the end of the day, you have three meals a day. This isn't a third world country prison. You know, your your family doesn't have to come feed you. You have shelter. Mm -hmm. It's just what you make it. Mm -hmm. Like anything else. And there's some people who go to prison and they do start going on the journey of changing their lives while they're in there. But for the most of us, you know, it's just more of the same. Mm. Have you thought about doing work in prisons? I think about doing all types of work everywhere. So prison yeah, well, is, tell yeah. me about that. Yeah. What, what do you, what, what do you, what would you like this to become? Yeah. So what we do now, we would love since we do it on a national level, we would love to do it internationally for people to see that, um, to look beyond a label, to look beyond an appearance and to see that this person is going through stuff exactly the way you are for the most part, that, our experiences may be different, but the way we feel them are the same. You know, this is what connects us. Not not necessarily, oh, you live this way. No, how, how we feel. Like, we all feel the same way. The, the bond of a mother and a child is the same around the world, you know. And, and if we focus on the things that bring us together, usually it'll bring us together. Mm-hmm. You know, I always think I love the word redemption. I think redeem things that are redeemed, and I and one of the things that I've uh, in my own life and in experiences have uh, begun to believe yeah. is that everything is redeemable. Yeah. You know, if the scripture says, "I can bring beauty from ashes." Yeah. So you look at a pile of ashes in a fire pit, and you yeah. think. If you believe, like yeah. you said, the, the work is to believe, which is a very biblical yeah. principle. The work is to believe. Yeah. That's the hard part, actually. Yeah. It's the hardest. That's the hard part. But if you believe, that, then there can be beauty brought from the ashes, yeah. which I feel like is what's happened here. Yeah. You know, that yeah. bad hand, dealt a bad hand, you and your brother, he, right. he loses his legs. You, you're dealing with depression. You're dealing with feeling hopeless. And you, but now, you know, from that low point, from that bottom, you're starting to see beauty. Yeah. yeah. Come from the ashes. Of course. The power of that, I mean, that testimony, that yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah. Because it's true it's very for true. you. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. This isn't something you read in a book, right? Yeah. And so I, I think about that message I mean I'm, I should be on your board of directors I think <laughs> but I mean it's an exciting yeah. it's an exciting message you guys have because it's real you have your brothers you, you're doing it together and think about the young people the prisoners yeah. the gang members the people that you all can relate to the, the veterans yeah. who come back and lost their legs yeah. think about the people you guys can relate to and the people who, who, when they hear the message and they say, well, if these stories can be redeemed, my story can be redeemed. Yeah. I mean, isn't that kind of the yeah. thought? That is. It's very exciting. Yeah. And we know it to be real. You're right. Um, you know, the believing, you start believing when you see it in your own life. And, you know, a lot of people are afraid to take that step, but you have to take that step to start trying to live better. And, you know... You got to be okay with what happens, and usually it's good things. And have you gotten like, have you become uh, good at doing that? No matter how you feel, doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. Yeah, there's no other way. I don't care how I feel. I'm yeah. doing this. Yeah. I mean, is that kind of how it's? It's exactly how it is. Um, you know, I have the advantage of knowing what doing it the wrong way feels like and looks like. I know that it's very real. The consequences of living life the wrong way are very real. And it's insidious. You think you're getting by, but you're not. Eventually, it's going to come for you. And um, did, you ever, did you ever have a relationship with your dad after all this? Yeah, that was the journey. I ended up forgiving him. You did? <laughs> yeah. You know? I ended up really? For, I ended up... Um, yeah, after I got out of prison, I was in L.A., back in L.A. for two years. And, you know, my dad had always 
even though he wasn't around, he had always said that if ever you need a getaway, you can come with me. And um, I was getting my hair cut one day. I walked out of the, the barber shop. I see a guy, you know, he's got a gun. He lets off like eight rounds. Uh, my friend gets skimmed in the head. He's bleeding. And then I was like, man, I got to get off my parole. I don't think I'm going to make it off parole if I don't if I don't do anything. So I took my dad on that offer and, you know, I lived with him for about three, four years. And we had a lot of talks and we cried together, you know, and I just saw him like I ended up seeing my mom like another person. Going and he's his got his story. own story. And he's got his very own story. Um, for me, the hardest part was forgiving myself. Um, I didn't know how to do that. And to be honest, you know, that's where the surrender comes in. How do I forgive myself? You know, who am I? Like, how does that work? Um, especially when you've been a part of the things that I've been a part of. And, you know, for me and my story, I needed to go to God mm-hmm. for my life to change. Do you feel forgiven by God? 100%. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. This is incredible. Thanks. I'm a big fan. I'm in. Thanks. Whatever Thanks. you need. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Jose's, Jose's book, uh, Jose's memoir is coming out. Yeah. Love, Faith, and Violence, a true song and story set to be released this month yeah. or soon. End of the month. Yeah. End of the month. We're going to buy some copies. <laughs> yeah, where, where can people buy that? Uh, you're going to be able to buy it on our website at uh, weareallonestory.net. We'll have a link up there for you, and then we'll also put it on our uh, Instagram shop as well. Awesome. I'm going to read it. Awesome. It's yeah. great to meet you. Great to meet you. Congratulations. Great story. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Peace.